Cool, so the next point I kind of wanted to touch on is all about confidence, and there's a lot of people that were writing in, and one particular person said, I'm 19 years old and I have no self-confidence at all. How do I even get started developing confidence in what I can do? Yo, the, the important thing to know is that you don't, you, you're not like born with confidence, you don't just have confidence. And when you start something new, you definitely don't have confidence in it. Like we could find a very confident person and if I asked them to fly an airplane like to Australia, <laughs> they're not gonna have much confidence. Right. You know what I mean? So like people think, oh, you, I'm just supposed to be confident, but it takes practice and you need to get good at the thing before you have confidence. Like, mm. otherwise, no one's going to just be confident doing something they've never done. Mm. So that's the first kind of mind trick that people do to themselves. You know, they might try business for a day. They don't feel very confident in it. So they're like, oh, I'm just not good at this or I'm, I don't have the confidence. And they might say that the confidence is the thing stopping them from doing the business. But it's not. It's, you know, they need to keep doing it, keep doing it, and then they get it. So the key really is, is practice. Like, mm. you know, it's like, uh, let's say you wanted to be good at basketball or football or whatever, or swimming, you know, you, it takes practice. And that's like, you know, hours in the pool or hours on the court or, you know, uh, the amount of like miles you've run if you're training for a marathon or whatever. Mm. Like you need to practice and you need to practice a lot. And pretty much someone's confidence is in direct proportion to practice. Mm. So, you know, why... You know, why is some pilots so confident to land in, you know, really tough airports? Because there's airports around the world, like Hong Kong's one of them, where it's, like, really hard to land. In Queenstown in New Zealand, that's another one that's really hard because of the mountains and everything. Oh, got it. You know, people, like, they're the pilots that have done the most hours, and they're the pilots that have, you know, flown in really tough situations. That's how they gain confidence. Mm. And, you know, why, uh, you know, why was that dude willing to walk across that wire between the Twin Towers? I didn't know if someone did that. Yeah, well, like, when the Twin Towers were there, there was a wire that went between them, and a dude walked across it like a tightrope. Got it. It's like a documentary, Man on Wire or something. It's really good. Hmm. But why was he confident to do that? Would you, like, would you or I be confident to do that? No yeah, way. Definitely wouldn't. It's because it, he practiced that his entire life. Hmm. That's how he got the confidence to do it. So I bet you the person asking that question, like, how do I gain self-confidence? Well, in what? <laughs> you know, that's the first question. Right. And then once you've defined that, then it's practice of that. So it's how do, if it's like, how do I gain self-confidence in, in business? Like, how do I gain self-confidence to be able to sell to people? Well, practice. Mm -hmm. Practice doing that. And it doesn't have to be a good cheat to get around, like, the actual thing. Because sometimes a lot of people think, oh, in order to get good at sales, I have to just do sales. But it's easier said than done because you're petrified of sales. So how can you do sales to get good at it when you're petrified to even start? Mm -hmm. All right, so you get stuck. It's like a stalemate. And one thing uh, that I figured out when training our, you know, our students in the consulting.com programs is I could teach them how to sell really well and for some people, that gave them the confidence they needed to start. But still for most, even if they knew what to do and they had the script and they knew who to do the calls with, they still didn't have the confidence to do it. Hmm. So I thought, well, how can we get around this? And the, the best way to do it was like, you know, I just thought about sports. There's a lot you can learn from looking at sports and then business because in sports, they have practice. You know, they have mock games. They have, you know, they have drills, they have, you know, different exercises that they do so that they're confident when those situations happen during the game. Mm. And if you think about an, a live sales call with an actual prospect as the game, then you want to start thinking of what can be a good practice environment. And the best way I've found so far is to get, is to pair the, the students up. So say, you know, we tell everyone in our program, like post in the Facebook group and look for someone who's willing to practice the sales uh, script with you. And then what happens is people pair up and they role play, like someone will be the, uh, the prospect and then someone will be the consultant and they'll go through a, a mock conversation. 
and then they go through levels of like intensity. So if someone's brand new to selling, you know, the, the prospect will be easy on them. Mm. But as they get better, the prospect gets more and more like difficult to deal with, to, to practice. And at first I had my reservations about doing this because I was like, will this really simulate the real world environment and everything? And it, it definitely did. Like people would just do these practice calls and then after they did enough of them, they weren't scared at all to do the real ones. Hmm. So it seems silly to practice something like a sales call, but it, it isn't. Because just think about it like in sports. You know, no one just goes out and jumps into an NBA game right. without a whole lot of practice. Mm -hmm. And no one goes and competes at the Olympics without four years of preparation for that one race. Mm. Like, you know, in, behind an Olympic race is four years of prep. And then probably a whole lifetime before that of, of practice as well. Absolutely. So to answer his question, I mean, self-confidence in what? Because you, no one is just self-confident in everything. And if mm. they are, they're an idiot because they're going to get burned. Right. You shouldn't be self-confident in everything. And that it becomes arrogance at that point. Well, it becomes stupidity because mm -hmm. the person can't fly a, a, an airplane. Mm -hmm. So he's going to die. <laughs> and so that's why you don't have self-confidence in everything. And so, in what is the question? And then once we know what that is, then it, the answer is practice. And if he's st too scared to practice with the real world environment, simulate one. Mm. What if they're too scared to even reach out and ask someone else for a practice? Well then, they, that's a good question. And that, the stage before that is learning. So you can't practice until you know what to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the, first, the stage really before practice is learning, and that's just reading and just, just being a sponge and sucking up information. So you want to read books on sales. I'm assuming here, like, let's just say for this conversation's sake that it's sales, because that's a big one. It probably is. Pretty much everyone's afraid of sales. I mm -hmm. was, and a lot of people are. So... You know, you're not going to be confident practicing until you know what to do. So read sales books, like, uh, you know, read f at least five books. Once you read five books, you're going to know quite a lot. And then, you know, figure out how sales is done for your particular thing, which you're doing. And then once you know all the information, then start practicing in a simulated envir environment. Once you're good there, go to the real world one. Mm. Got it. Now, on those sales calls too, so I, I agree, I think they can get through just about anything and then even the prospects can ask more difficult questions where they have to objection handle and whatnot. But what about the actual taking of the money? I feel like when people go to make an ask for money, and I had this uh, problem early in my career too, is like there's always that slight hesitation when you wanna flip the corner and then you're gonna make your offer. And I see it time and time and again with people in the community too, is when they drop the price, it comes something like this. They're like, and um, it's, uh, $3,000 for the service. How did you get over um, the fear of asking people for money yourself? That's a good question. And you can't just get over it. Mm. Like, it, it takes time, right? Because it's really conditioned in you, like, from not having money and not being able to buy things that, because when someone's young, they can't, because they don't have lots of money, right? right? So they're used to not being able to afford anything and being let down when the price is more than... And so you're like conditioned this way. And so it takes time, and it, it's a gradual process to get over it more and more and more and more and more. But the, the best way, really, is to get so good at what you do and what you're selling that you feel like you're doing the person a disservice by not selling them your thing. Mm. So you turn it upside down. People think they're doing a disservice by taking someone's money. Well, I think that I'm doing a disservice by not taking someone's money and giving them what I've got. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if someone takes, if gives me their money and they take my training program and they actually do it, they're going to make way more money than what they gave me. Mm -hmm. So it's a no-brainer for me. And like I, I have that actual mindset. I don't feel an ounce of guilt at all because I know what I've got's good and it's proven in everything. And mm. so the best way to change that belief is 
to make your thing insanely good. Just keep working on it, keep working on it, keep working on it until you're really confident in it that you have that belief. Mm. Now, I know we get people come up to us too, and maybe another factor too is like people always say, oh, that's too cheap, like you should be selling that for more too. Do you think that you should strategically price what you have a little bit under what people perceive the value is just so you have that confidence that what, you, what you're selling is not only great and going to have the results, but it's also, uh, it's also like way, way more valuable than um, you could potentially uh, have by increasing the price. Say like, people are like, I'd pay five times that amount. What's, what's the right price? Is it okay to sell something that someone only gets 1.5 times the amount of value from investing one in? And like, what's that ratio that you can just have extreme self-confidence? Well, it's so speculative price that like there is no formula mm. and I don't think there ever will be because it's just one of those things. It's what someone's willing to pay. And, you know, it's like what is, uh, you know, what is a particular painting worth? Mm. I think last week someone bought like a famous painting for like 400 million US. You know, is that, how can we prove the value ratio on that? Right. You know, so like price is a very weird thing and... The best way when you're starting out is to really look at what other people are charging and kind of price similar to that because like when you're starting out, it's you, your price isn't the main thing. You know, when you're starting out, getting started is the main thing mm -hmm. and doing it because from there everything else happens. And so you don't want to be too scientific about all of this stuff because over time or everything's going to change. And the, mo the main thing when you're getting started is to start. So if I think back to my first things, like uh, when I was selling, uh, one of my first ever things was their online job board. I just looked at what like other job boards kind of charged and I priced below that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with my property inspection software app, I looked at what the market was charging and I just kind of positioned pretty much around that. And there was no science behind that, but that wasn't the main thing. You know, the, the thing I needed to be improving on was just doing it. And then over time, the price morphs and changes and it, it gets to the right space. So I think when you're starting out, just look at what other people are doing, kind of match that. And also, uh, a good value ratio is really like, you know, look at, the, look at the value someone can get from what you provide. And I think a real good a sweet spot is like 10 to 1. Mm. So if you help someone with a service and uh, they make, you know, they make $10,000, or well, if you charge $1,000 for your service, mm -hmm. that's insanely good value. Mm -hmm. And a person who gets 10 grand from one grand in services, they're going to recommend that to their friends. They're going to do all of that. And the higher you can get that ratio of value to price, the more viral your thing's going to become. You know, like the iPhone, it's got a lot of stuff for like the $600 or $800 price that it's got. Like, it's really good value. And that's why people talk about it a lot. They could probably price the iPhone at like 10 grand and they'd still have a huge market. Mm. But, you know, they want it to be down there so that people just rave about it because then, uh, you know, the net effect is they're going to make more. Mm -hmm. And that takes time and practice to play with and everything. Uh, and I do think it's always better to have people rave about it and price cheaper than it is to price expensive, make more money, but not have it spread like a virus. Right. Got it. Yeah, it's a better long-term play. I agree. Um, and then also, I guess going back to the confidence thing too, when you were starting, um, what was the biggest um, break point where you had to jump out of your comfort zone like what was the situation you were terrified and, and how did you overcome like if you had to think about business wise the most terrified you ever were in a certain situation there's lots of them um, well, probably one of the first ones I ever had was like sales calls mm. you know when well, one of the very first ones I had was when I had that job board business and that didn't require sales calls, it required like marketing. And I had no idea how to market anything, so I thought, well, I'm just gonna go to the universities on foot and just hand out brochures. <laughs> so I spent like pretty much the last 500 bucks I had printing brochures, like this huge box of them. 
think I got 5,000 of them. <laughs> and then like, I was like, yeah, I'll hand out 5,000, easy. And then I arrived there in my car with this box of brochures and I was so nervous to get out that I didn't go the first day, I just sat there. Then the second day I came back and I somehow like mustered up the courage to start handing them out. No one wanted them, so it was like even harder. And I definitely remember that, that's vivid in my memory. And that business didn't work out. And then the next sort of business I did required like phone calls to try and sell like websites and things to people. And I remember I was petrified of that. I'd put it off, I wouldn't get out of bed, and you know, I'd tell myself I'll call them at 9 a.m. when they get into the office. But then 9 a.m. would come and I'd be like, oh, they're probably just getting into the office. You know, I'll let mm -hmm. them kind of get their things under control, then I'll call them. Then mid-morning would come, then I'd think, oh, they're probably getting ready for lunch. And <laughs> then it would get to the end of the day and then it would be the next day. And the more I put it off, it, it was, that was really hard. Like that, that really got me, like the sales calls, probably way more than the, the, the brochure thing was the first one, mm. but the sales call one was way worse. Yeah. Because the first call, cold call I ever made, the guy just hung up on me straight away. So like, I, that, that was so hard to get around because they had such a bad start. And I, I tried everything, even having like a couple of beers before like doing the phone calls. Mm -hmm. And man, that was a tough one, but. Have you ever dialed someone then hung up before they could even answer? Um, I can't remember, yeah. probably. But I remember when I was calling, I was always just hoping that they actually didn't pick up. They go to voicemail. Is, which yeah. is kind of messed up because you're really <laughs> trying to sell things. Right. But your brain just plays tricks with you. Mm -hmm. That's funny. So what, what was the, the tipping point there? Um, was there any moment that you can remember where you're like, maybe it's starting to get easier if it was a gradual process or there was one moment where you're like, okay, I got this. What, what was that point? It's just practice, honestly, mm -hmm. like nothing really changed. The amount of people who would like hang up, hang up on me or, or not listen to me or whatever was still the same, but I'd just done it more. So it just kind of rolled off my tongue easier and I just got hardened to, I got hardened to like, to the rejection and everything. Mm -hmm. And over time you get hardened, like, you know, you get, once you've, like a good way to put it might be, you know, if you've spent time in the cold, like out in snow and everything like that, when cold comes around, you're not, you're all right. You're like, oh, I've been here, this is fine. Mm -hmm. This isn't even cold. Right. But the first time you have it, you, you think you're gonna die. Like I've had friends come over from Florida and I'm like, they're, they're freaking out, like <laughs> totally freaking out in New York. And one of them won't even come, just, just no flying in, in the winter. Just because they're petrified of it. Yeah. And so it's just like that, you know, you're just not used to it and you're not, you haven't been exposed to it, so it's gonna scare you. Mm. And, you know, another one, another good example might be like the window washers that I see out here. Dude, I look at them and they, I like, I'm scared for them <laughs> and I'm uncomfortable. I'm like, I'm like getting sweaty and stuff just looking at them because it's so high. But, you know, they've just done it enough times, it's not scary anymore. Mm. And phone calls is just like that. Like, after you do it, and the, the amount that it takes to actually, for the fear to kind of disappear, it isn't that many times. It's just that initial hump. I would say after probably, I would say after two weeks of actually doing it daily, it, the fear kind of started to disappear. Got it. It's just a matter of just when you woke up, knowing that you had to do that and you were going to do it no matter what? Like, because on, on some of them you said you would procrastinate, like 9.15. Would you eventually call those people or would you just kind of call it a day? Let's say at 5 p.m. and just be like, oh, yeah. In the beginning, I'd just call it a day. Uh -huh. And, but once I started, you know, consistently doing it daily, that's when, that's when I started to conquer the fear. Mm. The key is consistency. It's because once you let it slip for one day, it's like, one day becomes two, two becomes a week, a week becomes a month, a month becomes a year. Like an avalanche happens from one small thing. Mm. And you've got to be extremely careful of that. Like you can't lie to yourself because, you know, even now, like I think about it with, with going to the gym in the morning, if I let one day go, I know what's going to happen. Like it's an avalanche, you know, one day is going to become the week and all of this. Same with diet if you, you know, let your diet slip or, or any of these things, 
So the key is to consistently do it and not lie to yourself and think, oh, this one day doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. So, and also, we had someone who wrote in, this is very similar to what they were kind of experiencing. They said um, what they're struggling with is the fear of knowing what they must do. And I'm guessing that what they know they must do is probably the sales call. Like they know that that's what they need to do in order to make money and make their whole business work. And then doing something without knowing if they'll be able to pull it off is their biggest fear. Um, like how do you get past that of like they know they got to do it, but they're just sitting there paralyzed, um, not knowing if they're going to pull it off or not? Well, you never know if you're going to be able to do it or not. Mm. Like you, you, get, you get a higher level of possibility of being able to pull it off over time, but it's dangerous to think that you're going to pull anything off because that, that means that you, you know, you've broken like the universe and that you can, you control the world <laughs> pretty much. So like, you know, even the best investors in the world, they say the times which they've lost everything is when they think they know everything, right? Mm. So you, you're never gonna get to that point because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You just get a slightly more confidence each time. Right. But like to answer his question, why is he afraid to do the thing he knows he must do? Uh, it's honestly messed up. That's like, that's the, that's like the human condition. He's <laughs> asking like the question which, is, which could like fix the whole world. <laughs> but like why do people, really what I've noticed and observed is that people's choice of daily actions totally misalign to their desired future. So someone might have this desired future for themselves in their life, and then their choice of daily actions is pretty much the exact opposite of that. Mm. So like I used to have a, you know, a, a vision and a desired future to have like a successful business and all of this, but it was very hard to change my daily actions of, you know, partying, drinking, going out with friends and going out for lunch and all and keeping up social appearances and things like that. And really it's just it's a misalignment of like future and current and present. So the present, you've got to break habits. That's the, that's the problem with the present. The future, you can change your vision out here. Like it's very easy to change your vision, but the hard part is to, to break the habits that make the vision. Mm. So like I'm guessing that whatever his vision is, the habits he's got now don't equal that. And he's got to break those things. Right. So in, in oftentimes, I, I remember you mentioned before, you had to change your environment before you could even do that, too. Because, That's the easiest way. Yeah. It's like a, a hack. It's like a computer cheat. Uh -huh. Like, <laughs> if ever you want to change your habits, just change your environment, because then pretty much it all goes. Mm. Right. So for you, how many times do you think you've like actually changed your environment in a big way? through the course of your, your career so far? One, the first one was moving out of my parents. No, the, actually the, before that, I used to like have roommates and stuff and we'd be renting when I first was at college and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And then to start my own business, I actually had to move back in with my parents mm. because that I had to sacrifice the being cool and having you know, the freedom and everything I had to sacrifice that to have the money to start the business. So that was the first environment change. And while the environment was, you know, moving back home, it, it meant there wasn't parties and everything. It meant there wasn't always people to talk to. But it was also a decision to sacrifice something. Mm. So, like, I was purposefully putting myself in a worse situation so that I could win in the future. Right. And that was a good decision. Like, I was sacrificing now for the future, and it was... It's like putting skin in the game, you know? Mm. That was the first environment change. Then the second one was moving out of there and into my first like, apartment, which I had to myself. And that was a big jump because that involved like, having a lease to commit to. Right. So I'd, been, I'd, you know, I'd grown my business up to the point where it was making about five grand a month in my parents' garage. Uh, and having no actual real... Uh, obligations. You know, my parents didn't force me to pay anything, mm -hmm. and all of our, all of the expenses we had could be cancelled within a month, and this was my first, like, 
it was a two year lease and it was like, I was like, am I going to be able to make money consistently? Mm. I'd never thought about my five grand a month. Is that really good every month? And so that change there put me on the hook for something. And that was really good because it lit a fire in me and I, that's where my business took a big jump because all of a sudden I was on the hook. Mm. And so I, moved, I, you know, I, I worked harder. And then the next one was probably the biggest jump I've ever done was moving from New Zealand to New York. Because you, know, you bring New Zealand dollars to New York and you bring New Zealand dollars to America and they're just cut in half. Mm. And then everything in New York is the most expensive in the world. That's true, I mean, yeah. that, like, my power bill here was, like, per month was, like, pretty much more than my rent. <laughs> so that was one hell of a jump, and that scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And everything was so expensive, and, you know, I moved straight into this place, which mm. is really expensive. And all of a sudden, everything just got way more expensive, and mm. my money got cut in half, and I was in a foreign country. So logically, that means that it's a stupid decision. Yeah. But what happened in reality was it just lit a massive fire in me. Mm. And I just worked harder than ever. And that's when I made the biggest jump I've ever made. So sometime, in the beginning, I think it's good to change your environment. Sometimes you've got to move backwards a bit because you know, you've, you've loaded yourself up with too many personal life expenses which you don't need. So the first one is a, set, is a decision to sacrifice. And then once you've sacrificed and you've gotten started, it's a decision to, to like play at a bigger level. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and then at this, and at this point too, so like you always hear the phrases of people that say like always live within your means. Like that doesn't, it's good advice, but it doesn't always work and it doesn't always get you to where you need to go if you're wanting something more out of life, I suppose. I think in the beginning, most people live outside of their means, and that's their problem. Mm. You know, most people I know that have a day job and wish they didn't, they spend all their money every, every month. Mm -hmm. Like, when they get paid, it's like, oh, we can go out tonight, like, to the pub. And these people are my age, and some of them even make, like, six-figure salaries, mm. right? It's, <laughs> it's um, that sort of behavior is, is, not going to help you ever. Uh, you should never live like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not the way to live. And it's because it's no self-control and it's, it's not saving anything for like a rainy day and it's pretty much thinking that's always going to be there. And that it's not. Mm. So that's a bad way to live. I think most people need to learn first to go within their means. It's a bit of self-control. And then once they've mastered that though, there's like decisions of playing at a bigger level. And that's, you know, that's deciding to put yourself on the hook for, for big expenses and things, knowing that by doing that, it's going like to light a fire on you to stretch there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be necessarily like a living situation, too. It could be like a business investment as well, just like something that they're leveling up their playing field. Maybe it's like rent for their office or, um, or a business loan because they need the inventory to cover uh, a purchase order that they just purchased, something like that, as opposed Generally, to... Generally, if, if it's a smart business decision, but it stretches you, mm. that's, a, that's like a good one. Got it. You know, you don't want to be stretching yourself for like a Lamborghini. Although, <laughs> you know, sometimes even things like that can make someone work. work. Mm -hmm. Like there was, I read a book on psych, like uh, psychology and they said that if you gave someone a, a sales rep a Ferrari, and then said, if you don't meet your quota, you, we take it back. Uh, they work really hard. Yeah. So, you know, once someone has a, once someone's achieved a level, they will never want to let it go. Mm -hmm. So, like, sometimes even weird things like that can make, can light fires in you. But I think in the beginning, most people are too used to living outside, and they've got to pull it back. Got it. And then comes the sort of, the increase. Got it. That makes sense. Um... Cool, and then alternatively, so that, that was like a person saying, the fear of knowing what I must do. Then alternatively, there was someone who I thought was interesting said that the fear of knowing what to do. So it's like the exact opposite. It's like someone who is, they know exactly what they do and they're just paralyzed, but then someone who has so many options, they're also paralyzed. Both people are equally paralyzed. 
Um, what, what do you do, what did you do about putting yourself out there in the beginning and feeling insecure about the different things you were considering? Like what's, what's the best possible situation for someone considering a lot of things? Sure, well, the, you really learn in life like that you can't, you can do almost nothing. Like, you know, with the amount of time you have, the amount of, you know, in your life and then the amount of time in your days and weeks and years, I mean, you can pretty much achieve nothing unless you just go all in on some one, on one thing. Mm -hmm. And even then it's hard. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people think like starting multiple businesses and having a, you know, a side gig here and a side gig here and all, like it never works like that. Mm -hmm. The people who do good at things just do one thing and that's it. Like Michael Phelps' daily to-do list was wake up, get in pull. I love that. That was it. Yeah. And pretty much mine is wake up, go to desk. <laughs> But that's pretty much all I do. It's, I don't really do anything else, so then that's how I get good at it. Mm. And really, you've got to understand that to get good at things, you're going to have to sacrifice everything that isn't that thing. Mm. Like, I think a lot of people, they think that they can start a business and keep their social life as it is, and keep like their drinking life if they like going out and partying, and keep their video game life, and keep keep all of these lives like while starting this business and it's not really true like it but starting a business and becoming you know you can you can start a mediocre business with a whole bunch going on right mm -hmm. but to get really good at something it, you got to you got to sacrifice it all mm. everything's got to get cut and i mean you can i'm not saying like you know you can still have a family and a relationship and those things but all of those other things which you're probably used to like they're going to get cut Mm -hmm. So I would just, if I was that person asking that question, I would think, what do I truly want? Like one year, three years, five years, what do I want? Like where do I want, maybe they can't answer it specifically, but what, what sort of life do they want? Where do they want to live? What do they want to do? Like how much money do they want to have? Kind of paint that picture in the future and that will dictate what they need to do now. Mm. And then they just, they need to, you know, practice like non-attachment to all of these things. Mm. Cause you need to get rid of it all. Like I had to get rid of everything because you carry around so much like baggage of things that you need to just drop it all and just channel everything in. Mm. So if someone's considering, let's say three different businesses and they're like, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna, do three at once, which obviously is most of the time a bad idea. Um, how, what, what's the better way to evaluate which of those three businesses they should do? Should they just pick one and then go after that randomly, like flip a coin? Or should they maybe uh, evaluate each one separately, kind of learn this a little bit best, more about it? That's the best method I've ever seen for it. Gun to your head. Gun to your head. So just imagine that you're, you know, someone literally pulls a gun, puts it to your head. And they're like, you have to choose the one business that's going to be successful. And if it isn't successful and you choose it, you get killed anyway. <laughs> but if you don't pick one in the next like two minutes, you get killed anyway. Mm. Right? Right. And be serious about that decision. And Pete, sometimes I get people to do this and they're like, oh, no, nah, but I can't do that. And I'm like, but then you're dead. <laughs> so you have to. And they still can't get their head around it, but they're dead. Yeah. So you have to choose one. And then they're trying to use logic and all of this stuff, but you don't have time for that. You don't have time to evaluate pros, cons, all of that stuff's pretty much bullshit anyway. Mm. Like when you're put in a situation like that, where it's life or death, you, you make really good decisions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, the, that's what I would do every time. Gun to your head, what is it? And then start with that. Because the, the beauty of it is, is if that's wrong anyway, it doesn't matter because at least you've started. Now you can start on the second one and you've already got the momentum. And pretty much the first thing people start with is never the thing that's successful. Mm. So the key is just to start. But a lot of people get paralyzed at the start lines trying to find the right business. I mean, the people who, when I first started, the people who were paralyzed there with me, they're still there now. And I've done 12 wrong things and found the right one. Yeah. <laughs> so, but they still haven't picked the right one because it's impossible. So the key is just do the gun to your head exercise, whatever it is, start it. 
If that's wrong, it doesn't matter. Start the next one, play gun to your head again, mm -hmm. and just keep going. Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you.